Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Raja Shahade, well-known writer, human rights activist, has been in the forefront of the struggle at one point of time on the issue of Palestinian rights. Raja, good to have you with us. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Raja, the, of course, everybody is discussing with Jerusalem's status having been sort of taken off the table, as Trump puts it. Does it mean that the Oslo Peace Accord is finally uh, buried and there is really now the need to rethink what's going to happen in Palestine? Well, let me first start by saying that uh, Jerusalem has been lost to Israel for many years now because immediately after the, the uh, 67 war, <coughs> Israel uh, did what it didn't do for the rest of the West Bank, which is to annex Jerusalem. And the annexation of Jerusalem happened very carefully so that they never used the word annexation. Uh, they were very worried about the reaction of the world and, and they, they did all kinds of tricks, legal tricks, which they're, they're very good at, uh, to, an, to effectively annex, totally annex, uh, legally annex, without using the word annexation at any point. And then they began to extend their sovereignty and presence to, to, to enlarge Jerusalem, not only to the East Jerusalem, which was uh, part of the West Bank. They went beyond <coughs> what was East Jerusalem, far beyond it, and, and he, uh, created a huge metropolis. And, uh, and th then... Those are the settlements originally outside Jerusalem, yeah, but abutting it. To the east of, uh, uh, of East Jerusalem. And going even up to Bethlehem, and, uh, and to Jericho. Jericho. Mm -hmm. So the huge expansion, what you're talking about, is the sat settlement. settlements which have gone up to Bethlehem. The settlements uh, were increased so that uh, uh, East Jerusalem was squeezed between West Jerusalem and the settlements east of East Jerusalem. And then they gave a very hard time, as they still do, to the, to the inhabitants, the Palestinian inhabitants of, of East Jerusalem. And then slowly they began to sever all ties between East Jerusalem and the West Bank, which were very, always very strong because it was part of the West Bank. And then after the Oslo, they did not allow people from, from the West Bank to visit Jerusalem or to, to come to use the institutions in Jerusalem, the hospitals, the, the various institutions, cultural institutions and so on. And, and so the process has been going on for a long time and has become total in the sense that uh, Jerusalem became part of Israel to all intents and purposes. And, and, and even though a quarter of the population of Jerusalem is, is Palestinian, uh, they were without rights essentially uh, because they were not citizens of Israel. So they, they didn't have any participation in the municipality of Jerusalem or in the P political life of, of uh, Israel. Then uh, in December uh, 6th, after urging the United States to, to uh, move its uh, uh, embassy, the United States decided to do so. Now, the question is why did they need to do this and, and raise all this interest around the world in the issue? which had been dormant in a, way, in a sense. And I believe it's because it was in the interest of Netanyahu who wanted another victory to extend his, his, his rule and uh, Trump to please his evangelist, evangelical uh, population who had, had supported him in his uh, uh, elections. You were saying that this is probably uh, not so much Jerusalem, but Netanyahu. Yeah, so, so the, the question as to why now, when, when effectively the city has been incorporated into Israel, and, and uh, this is all, only a formality, so to speak, it has to do with political considerations of Trump and Netanyahu. But as expected, perhaps, it aroused interest all over the Arab world and, and uh, people felt that Jerusalem is an important symbol, even beyond Palestine, and, and so they, they rallied behind it and so on. Uh, but perhaps the positive aspect of, of this is that it showed 
or proved rather that America, the United States, is not a fair arbiter of the, and, and should not be the sponsor of this peace process. Now, all of us in Palestine and all, anybody following the, the problem realize that the peace process is a sham. The United States was never a neutral umpire. Never as it a neutral. Were. And, and, and th there is so much evidence of this. But to, to violate so openly something that is in the agreement, in the Oslo agreement, which was that Jerusalem should be left to de be determined in the final status negotiations, and to go so openly against UN resolutions on Jerusalem and all international law, and all international law made it absolutely clear beyond doubt to, to everybody that, that the Oslo agreement is, is finished. Now, Netanyahu had started off from the very beginning attacking the Oslo agreement and wanting it to be done away with. Uh, he never liked it and, and he uh, demonstrated against it when, when, and he voted against it in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament. And so when uh, Abba, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the United, of this, uh, Palestine, which is not a state yet, but Palestine, said that the Oslo is dead, Netanyahu said he's done us a service. So uh, he, uh, this is to the liking of uh, Netanyahu. However, the problem we have is, okay, if it's dead, and, and we know it's dead, and the peace process is dead, what, what next? The problem is that the Palestinian leadership is not providing alternatives, viable alternatives. They're providing rhetoric and, and things that they think people like to hear, but it's, it's not a viable alternative. And that's the case that we are in now. A viable alternative would be really say, officially saying we pull out of the Oslo Agreement, okay. we go to the United Nations and uh, file a case against the uh, International Court of Justice, what would you think the Palestinian well, you know, Authority should do? Well, for example, going into the International Court of Justice is a very good idea. And I was on the commission which was preparing for the case. And, and excellent preparation was done by everybody, including al Haq, who, who prepared files and good evidence and so on. And yet there's so much pressure on the uh, court not to even investigate, do a proper investigation, you know, because that's the first stage has been so overwhelming that nothing, nothing has happened. And the pressure is also on the Palestinian uh, uh, authority not to submit the case. So, so although they keep saying we, we want to use the, this option, in fact, it's not being used because there's so much political pressure not to use it. If they do not want to lead the struggle of the Pal Palestinian people on the ground, the only option they would have is actually the International Court of Justice. There is really nothing else that the Palestinian Authority the International can Criminal Court. Criminal Court. Yeah. They can file cases in the International Criminal Court because Palestine is now some local standard in the That's United right. Nations. Yeah. So as Palestine, they can file these cases? They, they can submit for the court a, a, a case, but uh, this hasn't happened. And of course, the most important thing is, is uh, uh, nonviolent uh, struggle, which, which can bring some results. And the rhetoric of the Palestinian Authority is that, yes, we want to do this, we want to uh, wage that battle, but in fact, they're not doing it. They're not because it would be giving up essentially their government and whatever little they're able to get in terms of taxes from Israel? Well, uh, it's, it's political pressure. It's uh, uh, the, the fact that the head of this, the authority, Mahmoud Abbas, is not a person who really believes that you win anything by struggle. He, 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 he is really a nonviolent person, but he doesn't have any key, any means of getting there. So he's been too lame. And, and with Israel, it doesn't work to be lame. Uh, so we're not getting anywhere. What else can happen in terms of international uh, pressures, international movements, and something like the BDS campaign, the boycott, divestment, sanctions campaign? De definitely, the international community can do a lot. And, and in, in a sense, our hope is with the international community. But that's not to say that local groups are not doing anything. Uh, local uh, initiatives 
to 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 do nonviolent activity is is all over the place, but it's not coalescing into a, a strong enough common movement as happened in the first Intifada, for example. Now the fact is that uh, the Palestinian Authority has made important changes in the economic situation of the Palestinians. So now there are about 120,000 workers working in Israel. And, and so many people have taken loans from banks. Before, before the Oslo, Oslo, nobody could get loans from the banks because there were no banks in, in, in the, so people could afford to go on strike. Now, they say if we go on strike, for example, uh, we will not be able to pay back the loans and we lose our car and we lose our house and we lose furniture even that is uh, bought on borrowed money. So the situation has, has changed to, to create as though every way to make struggle more difficult to, to take place. And that was deliberate, by the way. But at the same time, ultimately, the youth will not continue under such conditions. And at some point, we don't know when and how, but struggles are going to break out. But what about Israel itself? What about the Jewish population? That seems, seems to have shifted even further to the right. And it seems that even the voices that could say certain things about human rights are being slowly silenced. You know, in, in a way, we haven't succeeded in our struggle against Israel. But in another way, we have succeeded in helping Israel self-destruct. Because uh, Israel now had started with some good things. They had rule of law for, for, the, for the Jewish community in Israel. They had socialism up to a, a point. Uh, they had some social welfare, some social welfare, which was very important. Uh, they had uh, good laws, good judiciary. Uh, and now all of these have been hit hard. So they make ridiculous laws in order to excuse the unexcusable. Uh, they have to violate international law back and uh, totally in order to excuse the unexcusable. They, they, they build settlements on land that is recognized even by their system as private land and nothing can be done about it. They violate the decisions of the, their own in, in high court of justice when it says you have to remove this settlement or you have to do certain things uh, to do with the army and so on. They violate their own rules. And that is very dangerous for, for, for a state because what enabled Israel to carry on with the settlement project was that they had some sort of organization that allowed it to happen without corruption, without, uh, that, that enabled it to happen. Uh, laws that were observed, regulations that were observed, and so on. And then, of course, the issue of Jerusalem itself is making the struggle even more so religious. And, and the religious in Israel is going to ultimately destroy Israel because the Orthodox are getting more powerful, more in numbers, uh, and, and, and they uh, have created problems which will only increase and, and will uh, bring about uh, such contradictions in the Israeli society that it cannot survive. I, I think that's, that's happening more so than ever. Becoming more and more nakedly a pariah state and an open apartheid state. That seems to be the picture. And as well as what you were saying, corruption of different kinds, which also includes Netanyahu. Yeah, and also a very important aspect of this is that they had great dependence on the Jews outside the diaspora, who were always, not always, but certainly after the 67 war, after their success in the 67 war, they became great supporters of Israel both in terms of money, in terms of uh, propaganda, in terms of public relations, and so on. And now they are beginning to be more alienated from Israel. In fact, many are ashamed of Israel, ashamed of, and they don't, many do not want to have anything to do with Israel. So they are losing that big support they have with, with the, uh, uh, their diaspora. 
And, and that also is an important element for them. Any last words for the future? I think and continue believe, to believe that uh, the conflict in Palestine is central to the conflicts in the region. Uh, it, it's, it's become more complicated than just Palestine, but I think the example of Palestine and how international law has not been helpful in resolving issues and how it's violated and, and how military and religious things are spreading and, and being successful because Israel is successful, are passing the wrong messages all over the region. The other thing that I also believe very strongly in is that the right of return is so central to the whole issue. And central because the lack of the recognition by Israel of Palestinian rights of the refugees enables Israel to say they came to a land that was free of people. And, and that is so central to the whole problem. Until they accept that Palestinians were there and Palestinians are a nation and they have the right to self-determination, nothing can, can change. And, and yet, after all these years of working on this and trying to speak to the international public and the local public, we haven't made great progress yet. And that's very unfortunate, I think. Thank you, Rajab, for being with us. Hope that we'll be able to contact you, speak with you, even when you are not in India. Thank you.